Well, I assume that we're on. Okay. Let's get started. We're a couple minutes late. Uh, my name is Howard Headley. I'm the president of the Utah Bankers Association, and uh, the Salt Lake Chamber has asked me to moderate today's webinar discussion on PPP forgiveness, and I know that's a hot topic for a lot of you that have called in. Um, thank you for joining us today. We plan to share with you the most up-to-date information on PPP loan forgiveness. Uh, we'd like to remind you that the question function is available for this webinar, so if you'd like to ask any of the panelists questions today, please use that function inside uh, the Zoom application. Our panelists today include our Senator Mitt Romney, uh, who's right at the forefront of what's happening on this back in Washington, D.C. Scott Anderson at Zions Bank, um, Susan Spears with the Utah Association of CPAs. And I think we have everybody on the call that we need to answer your questions today. I know Senator Romney has important committee meetings and assignments that he needs to get to, but Given the state of play in Washington, D.C. on PPP, we would really love for a quick report from him on the status of loan forgiveness in Washington and what the U.S. Senate specifically is considering this week. Thank you, Howard, and I appreciate the chance to speak with uh, uh, our colleagues throughout the state uh, and appreciate the work that's being done by your organization and by others that are part of this effort. Uh, I wish I could provide great clarity uh, and resolve the uncertainty that's in people's minds about how the forgiveness is going to be worked out and who's going to get what portion of their loan forgiven. Uh, and uh, I, I can't do that because in part, we haven't figured it out here in Washington. And one of the reasons we haven't figured it out is because Republicans and Democrats, well, we don't always agree. And then sometimes the House and the Senate don't get things aligned either. And then, of course, you have the administration and the Treasury Department that steps in and puts in place regulations trying to help resolve things, but in some cases, they create more confusion. So uh, I, I'm going to tell you what the process is, where we stand right now, and, uh, and apologize for the fact that I can't give you greater, greater clarity than, than, I, than I can. So let me, let me begin by, first of all, indicating that, as you know, the PPP program was put in place in a big hurry. Uh, we recognized that there was a, a crisis. We needed to get money out to small businesses as quickly as we could and give them confidence that they would have access to liquidity. Uh, and so a, a bill was passed, the very first CARES Act. It put the PPP program in place, uh, obviously insufficient uh, funds. And so we came back and put more, more funds into the program. Uh, and, uh, and there's still now additional funding that's available for uh, businesses that would like to take advantage of the program. But we didn't lay out all of the particulars, uh, just broad strokes. And, uh, and now trying to fill in some of the particulars is one of the tasks that's ahead of us. The, uh, the other is to deal with things that we hadn't considered, which is we anticipated that after maybe eight weeks or so, uh, that the economy would be back into full swing. And, uh, and therefore, the only uh, time that small businesses would need help would be over the first couple of months. Well, that's turned out not to be the case. Uh, this uh, COVID and the economic crisis associated with COVID-19 is going on longer than, than just eight weeks. And then, uh, as you know, there was a provision that said that 75% of the funding that uh, needs to be spent on, uh, on employees uh, and only 25% on other overhead. And, uh, and that didn't take into account the fact that some businesses have a very different mix of overhead versus uh, uh, direct labor. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, that, that 75 25 split may or may, may or may not have made a lot of sense. Uh, so, with those things in mind, what has happened is the following uh, The Senate got together, the Small Business Committee, on which I sit, we got together and talked about the challenges with the current PPP program and the uh, lack of clarity on which loans are going to be forgiven and in what proportion. And we worked out the things we thought needed to be done. Uh, at the same time, the House was, uh, uh, was having a, a, um, a, an effort to do the same, th same thing. They then passed by 400 votes to one a correction measure for the PPP program. They sent it over to us and they've left town. And they're gone until the end of June. They don't come back until June 30th. So there's no House. So if we make a change to their bill, uh, they're not there to accept it or to negotiate with us. And so we have to decide whether to take or leave their improvement 
provisions. Uh, and that's something we haven't decided yet. Uh, and yesterday at our lunch, Republican members were going back and forth on whether or not we would accept the changes that the House proposed. Their proposals, their proposals had uh, were of, of two uh, amounts that I'll, I'll point out. One was they said, look, instead of these funds having to be spent in the first eight weeks, they could be spent in the first 24 weeks. So that obviously gives a lot more uh, a time for people to be able to use the PPP money and still get full forgiveness. Um, and that's something which most of the senators think is a good idea. I think we, our feeling is it's too far. 24 weeks is perhaps longer than we needed. 16 weeks would have been better, but well, we got 24 weeks, maybe we have to go with that. The other thing they said was that instead of 75% of the funds having to be spent on uh, employees, uh, on salary and, and payroll, uh, that only 60% uh, uh, need needs to be spent on, on payroll. And, uh, and that also was a provision that we think is an improvement. So two things we think are improvements. One is extending the eight weeks to 24, and second is taking the 75-25 split and making it a 60-40 split. Both those things work. Uh, there's some things they didn't do that we wish they would have done. One, for instance, was to clarify uh, any questions of, of liability that, that banks uh, might incur uh, associated with, uh, with loans, perhaps, that were not uh, properly administered or, 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 or provided. And uh, that's something that we Republicans and we in the Senate wanted to deal with that didn't get done properly there. They also made a mistake. They made a drafting mistake. In their version, they said, uh, if, we, if you go to uh, uh, 60, uh, 60 uh, for payroll, uh, as opposed to 75% payroll, uh, that was an improvement. But they said that if you're at 59%, there's no forgiveness at all. Well, that's not what any of us wanted to have happen. We wanted that if you went below 60%, you had a proportional forgiveness, but not a cliff where you got no forgiveness. And the, the members of the House that we spoke with are saying, oh, that was just a drafting error. Well, the problem is they're gone, so they can't fix their draft. So do we pass it as is, uh, despite the fact that it would have a cliff for anyone who spent less than 60% on their employees? Uh, do we accept that or do we not? My guess is what you're going to see happen, and, and this is just based on the conversations I've had with other senators, is we will pass the House correction. We'll, we'll move the uh, eight weeks to 24 weeks. We'll also move the 75% on payroll to 60% on payroll, uh, even though it has that flaw. And then down the road, when the House comes back, we'll, uh, we'll try and get them to, uh, to correct by unanimous consent uh, uh, the, uh, the cliff that they put in place to a, instead a, a proportional uh, forgiveness. Uh, I'll mention one more thing, and that is that as you know, with regards to receiving a PPP loan, uh, you did make a, or a business did make a, um, uh, a commitment, a provision uh, that said that they are obtaining this loan and that without these funds, their business would not have been able to continue operations. And uh, a lot of people have just sort of brushed that aside, but I think it's very possible that the Treasury Department will really focus on that in a much more aggressive way than has been spoken about so far, particularly for larger loan amounts. Um, and, and that is that if a business uh, actually saw no reduction in revenue uh, and continues to be substantially profitable and went out and received a PPP loan, I would not be certain that loan is gonna be forgiven because the loans were of course intended to help businesses that, uh, that really relied on this loan to be able to keep their doors open and to keep employees on the payroll. So uh, that's, a, that's an update. I, I apologize for having more, uh, <laughs> more fog than clarity to provide for you, but that's in part because of the, uh, the legislative process that's underway right now uh, and the fact that, uh, that the House is out of session and won't be back till the end of the month. So with that, uh, uh, Howard, if you've got any questions that you want to pass along, please do. Thank you, Senator. Um, clarification on that last point. Are you anticipating that the Senate or the House may change how the Treasury is approaching that initial certification, or are you, do you embrace the $2 million threshold that they have um, on the guidance that they have released? They, they've said anything below $2 million, 
they're going to look at everything above two million, and if it's below two million, they're going to just assume that you needed the loan. Uh, you know, I can't I can't guarantee what Treasury will ultimately uh, decide, uh, but I think um, the the fact that there was an initial certification that individuals uh, needed these funds in order to maintain their business, uh, that if there are uh, enterprises which are, are are found to have had uh, no reduction in revenue and uh, and continue to be profitable during this period, and that they nonetheless avail themselves of funding, I I would not be a hundred percent certain that that the treasury won't uh, won't come after them or more or won't uh, reduce the amount of forgiveness or perhaps eliminate the forgiveness. I, I uh, th that's I think that's open for uh, for discussion. Uh, you may have seen that uh, one of the members uh, of the Republican Senate. Uh, Senator Ron Johnson uh, published a an op-ed in the uh, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. I think it was yesterday, uh, in in which he pointed out that there are some businesses businesses he's aware of that said, "Hey, this is free money. Let's grab it, even though our business is doing great." Uh, and uh, if there's enough interest behind that, I think Congress may act to say, "Hey, yeah, we want to take a look at those businesses that really did not need the money and that just uh, thought they were going to get free money from government and." Uh, uh, and I, I would not be certain that in those cases, the loans will be entirely forgiven or forgiven at all. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I want to thank you for all your efforts to get some clarity around this program. It's a critical program for uh, the economic recovery that we envision here in Utah. As you know, Utah leads the country in terms of the number of PPP loans given as a percentage of eligible payroll. And my hats off to the banks, the credit unions, and all the Salt Lake Chamber, all the business organizations. It's been a real team effort here, and I feel like that team effort continues with you and, and our, the rest of our delegation in, in getting clarity on these programs so that businesses know how to navigate these very ambiguous waters at times. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Howard, you know, I've got to run. Uh, what I'm running to is a vote. Uh, they've called a vote. Uh, we never know when votes are going to be called in, in advance, uh, but they've got a vote uh, that, that I have to go run to to fulfill my duty. Uh, so I'm going to leave you all. Uh, again, I'm, I'm proud of what uh, people across Utah have done. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the strength of our economy relative to the rest of the country is quite a tribute uh, to the leadership of this community. So well done and uh, Godspeed and, and uh, may your businesses thrive, grow, hire more people and to provide a bright future for all of you and for your families. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thanks for joining us. Um, we want to dive in. We've had a lot of questions in the Q and a section, and I think we're going to address some, a lot of those uh, either in writing or as we proceed on this conference call. Um, a lot of questions about, what Senator Romney just talked about um, in terms of the 60 and the 75%. Um, these were provisions that were adopted by the U.S. Treasury after the program was passed by Congress. Um, maybe we can go to Susan to talk about, uh, to provide a little bit more clarity on some of the questions. Um, you can spend 100% of the money on payroll. Um, if you do, that's what it was intended for. The 75-25 was to accommodate some flexibility 25% could be on certain eligible rent and utilities. But if you spend it 100% on, on payroll and you spent that within the eight week period, um, you can apply for forgiveness at this point anytime you want. Um, the rules on forgiveness have been issued and we're gonna talk about that guidance, um, I think next. Um, moving it to 60% meant to give you flexibility, but as Senator Romney indicated, it was technically done incorrectly. It needs to be fixed because it basically says if you can't get the 60%, you lose entire forgiveness. And that was not the intent. It's supposed to be proportional. So um, hopefully we'll get that technical detail fixed. But um, Susan, there's some questions on here about if, if we change it from A to 24, which is what the House bill does, does that mean that people have to wait for 24 months to apply for forgiveness? No, you can, you can apply for forgiveness as soon as you use up your funds, basically. Um, a lot of people were, were waiting for the final guidance. As you know, uh, SBA issued guidance, Treasury issued guidance 
the last week of May, May 22nd, but there are a lot of open-ended questions. But if you've used 100% of your loan for wages, you, you've used that money, or even the 75-25 rule as we have now, go ahead and, and apply for forgiveness. So the, the Treasury issued the guidelines on forgiveness just uh, um, a couple weeks ago almost. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at those, what does a small business who took a PPP loan need to do to get the forgiveness? Can you just talk about that process and, and then we'll get to Scott Anderson and talk about how much time that may take, um, what the time frames are. But maybe Susan, you could just walk us through what the documentation looks like and, and how difficult or easy that is as it stands right now. I, I, okay, so I, I would first of all start document, document, document. Of course, you're gonna hear that from a CPA regardless, but you have your PPP loan, make sure that you have that with you, you know, as one of your working documents as you fill out your loan forgiveness application, which is a form 3504, 3508 with SBA, um, that, that's gonna be your guidance. You're going to want to keep um, documentation as far as your payroll summaries, if you will. If you're using a third-party payroll service, um, certainly keep those reports that they're giving you, or even copies of the payroll summaries that you're preparing in-house. Many small businesses do their own payroll in-house. Um, keep those summaries. You may even want to be able to show that you that that payroll's been paid, um, showing those checks or those automatic deposits be you know on your on your bank statements if you're making re contributions employer contributions to retirement accounts show keep that documentation um, keep documentation as far as your full-time employees there's a whole con section in the um guy sba interim rules talking about full-time employees reduction of employees if employees are terminated and this gets very cloudy, and this is where things could, we wish could be a little more simple, but they are not. But for a small business, maybe this isn't going to affect you so much, but you're going to have a lot of this information in your payroll summaries that, that you're preparing in-house. Um, as you're aware, 25% under current interim rule we can use for non-payroll expenses, such as utilities um, and mortgage interest payments. Keep dog, you know, keep a copy of the bill and the check or the um, debit advice that's gone out of your bank statement to show that so that you can put that in your package that you'll be submitting to the lender. Um, interim rule has consistently stated that it is up to the borrower to show that they have done their due diligence and that they've spent the money properly. So the more documentation you can show, the better. Now, one question that we keep, you know, from our organization's standpoint is we've had various businesses and even some of our members call in, you cannot prepay utilities, you cannot prepay rent, you cannot prepay mortgage interest. So keep that in mind. That, that's kind of a 30,000 foot level. Um, we can certainly deep dive into some other questions if, if we have viewers with questions. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Um, it's important for each borrower to remember that each lender will approach this potentially uniquely. Um, and so the most important person you can talk to about these details are, is the lender from whom you received the loan. They're, they're, you are tied to them. That It's their loan. And, and uh, they're gonna give you a list of the documentation, whether you're an LLC or a C-Corp or a sole proprietor, they're gonna be able to tell you. And again, we got the guidance uh, about just over a week and a half ago. Um, and a lot of those lenders are digesting that and coming up with plans and, and, and sending those out to their borrowers. But what I wanted to do is just address those basic issues of uh, there is no, uh, you know, deadline, um, if they move it out to 24, that's meant to provide you more flexibility in terms of finding eligible expenses that you can then apply to the forgiveness of your loan. That's meant to make it more lenient. I know a lot of folks out there have already met those, 
eligible expenses within the eight week period and and they may be frustrated that other other borrowers are now going to get more time to spend those monies in a in an eligible way um, but that's just as we've looked at it we're trying to make it our goal going into it was to make sure Utah got a disproportionate amount of this money and and we really we were number one in terms of eligible payroll and our goal now is to make sure every borrower gets forgiven and I think by extending that period from 8 to 16 or even 24 gives you more time to accumulate eligible payroll expenses that you can then give to your lender and they can use to apply for forgiveness. So Scott, I want to get to you again and, and, and commend you and Zines Bank. Uh, you know, all the banks and all the credit unions, a lot of the credit unions got together and we worked together hard to, to get these loans out. But Zines is in the top 10 in the country and, and we're fortunate to have you and your leadership here. Um, for, a, for a borrower who now, as Susan outlined, is beginning to pull together the documentation as outlined by their lender, how long can they anticipate that process to take before they are going to hear word back as to whether or not their loan was forgiven? Thanks, not, okay, uh, let, let me just, uh, uh, first of all, throw out um, a, a, a kudo and a compliment to you as head of the Utah Bankers Association and to all of your counterparts around the country, because I hope people recognize that, that you have been urging Congress, and in fact, you sent a letter to Secretary Mnuchin and uh, the SBA Administrator uh, saying that we do need to have clarity on the issues of uh, forgiveness and that you urge them and the uh, Congress to consider a de minimis amount or threshold under which everything would be forgiven uh, with very little paperwork being required. And from what I hear in, in Washington is that that is taking um, a hold and that they are looking at something maybe up to $150,000 loan that uh, any, uh, anything below that amount would be uh, forgiven. But I think the principles we have to remember that, that the actual amount of forgiveness can be up to the full principal amount of the loan. And second, the actual amount of forgiveness will be uh, determined on uh, the amount of money that was spent on payroll during this forgiveness period, which is currently eight weeks, and then spent on interest, uh, mortgage interest, uh, uh, rent payments, and utilities. And I think that as a, a business thinks about forgiveness, um, uh, the, uh, we've had some borrowers who could actually, their eight week uh, uh, expired on June 1st, so they're eligible to uh, uh, apply now for forgiveness. But my advice is to first meet with their CPAs. And, and there's no real worry or rush to do this. And wait and see how the uh, Congress may modify the bill. Because if you have 24 weeks in the forgiveness period, rather than eight weeks, uh, that can make a real difference in the amount of your loan that's being forgiven. But once you turn in uh, your request for forgiveness to a bank, the bank has 60 days to review it and make a decision and send it on to the SBA. And then the SBA has about 90 days. So um, this, this can take almost six months uh, 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 to get that all processed. And that's one of the reasons that under the current rules, uh, Congress says that um, uh, there will be no interest or principal payments on the two-year loan for six months. So basically, you have between when you got the loan to December 31st of this year under the current guidance to apply without uh, uh, any penalty. And the penalty would be that you'd have to start making interest payments and principal payments at that time. So I, I, I think that uh, businesses need to meet with their CPA, decide what they want to do. As Susan said, gather the information that will uh, show what they spent the money on. And then from a payroll point of view, uh, you, you, you can go eight weeks 
from when you got the money in your account, or you can go from uh, the first payroll period following when you got the money in your account. And, and that may give uh, a few extra days uh, to a business to spend the money if they decide on that alternative route. Thanks, Scott. So let me just be very clear. Right now, the law is as it was originally written is an eight week period the treasury has said you can spend up to you can spend up to 25 percent of your loan amount on on rent and utilities and non-payroll expenses uh and that would leave you that you'd need to have at least 75 percent of your expenses on payroll that's the current state of play they issued guidance a couple weeks ago that says this is how you get forgiveness. And, and for many borrowers, the earlier borrowers, that guidance, that forgiveness period has begun. If you find yourself in that position and you start to gather the documentation that your lender tells you you need to have, and you find that you're not gonna to get to 100% of forgiveness, as Scott said, you're probably better off waiting. Uh, uh, give it a little bit of time. The house has passed a bill that would expand the payroll eligible payroll expenses from eight to 24 weeks. The Senate is considering that bill. We think there's going to be some added leeway there. Um, if you get to the end of the eight week period and you've spent the money on payroll and rent and utilities are eligible, feel free to go and, and, and start filling out those, that application and submit it to your lender. And the lender has up to 60 days to, to process that. I would just say be patient. We're learning. The lenders are learning this process as we go as well. Um, so, you know, if you, again, like if you were one of the early appliers, it was a little rough it, for the loan. I think the early appliers for the forgiveness, it you know, could be some bumps as we work through that. The other thing that Scott mentioned is that we're working hard to create kind of a, if those of you that fill out, you know, on your taxes, there's an easy approach. There's an easy form. We want to have an easy forgiveness form for borrowers under a certain amount. It might be 150, it might be higher, it might be lower, but we're encouraging the treasury to come up with an easy process that would cover most of the small loans. So again, if, you, if you've gotten to the end of this process and you're concerned about the amount of documentation that you have to put together or whether or not you're gonna have eligible expenses to get 100% forgiveness, as Scott said, I'd encourage you to, to, to wait and see what Congress does that might make this a little bit better. So Scott, I wanted to ask a question that I'm sure is in a lot of people's minds. If, if, you, if you do get through this forgiveness process either now or later and a portion of your loan is not forgiven what happens to the borrower at that point well under the current rules uh, what you have is a two-year loan and so any part of the loan that is not forgiven is amortized over the life of that loan that loan um, is at one percent interest uh, the first six months, uh, there is no interest or principal payment. So no interest or principal payments would happen until under the current rules, January of 2021. Uh, and then the principal would be amortized over the remaining 18 months of the loan. Uh, but uh, under the new rules that are being considered uh, for new loans, that could be extended from two years to five years on new PPP loans, and uh, it gives the borrower and the bank the ability to get together and talk about, should it be a two-year loan or a five-year loan? The advantage of the longer term is that you have uh, um, a, a longer time to amortize the loan over, which means that the monthly payments um, will be smaller. I think some businesses are concerned that if their loan is not forgiven, and they have to amortize that payment over 18 months, it could be a pretty significant payment that could uh, uh, put them in violation of some of their current bank uh, uh, loan conditions. Thank you, Scott. 
Um, is there, we have a question that asks, then does the, does the company have some obligation to return the PPP money if they weren't, they weren't able to expend it on payroll, rent, and utilities in that period of time? I think you've answered that, but maybe just answer that question again in, in the context of at the end of the forgiveness period, we weren't able to spend our money on eligible expenses. Are we required to return that money all, right all at once? And I, in my understanding, and I'd, I'd go to Susan, I, th I think we like to the CPAs as uh, the uh, experts in, in giving this advice, but my understanding is no, they don't have to return the money that's not forgiven. It would just be amortized over the life of the loan and they would just pay it back at a 1% interest rate. And 1% interest rate is a terrific rate. Susan, do you have anything to add there? I would agree with that um, to what Scott said as well. We worry about if we have monies that aren't forgiven, as the rules are currently written, we have that two year, 1%, six months interest free. Um, this could be a big burden on some of our small businesses that weren't able to utilize that. So I, I tend to agree with Scott. I would say let's, um, you know, as we're interpreting these rules, um, let's make the payments over the, over the two year period at 1% and, and, and call it good. But also, I would also hope that we can get Congress to extend this eight week to the 24 week, because you know, if if recall when these when the PPP um, legislation was passed, the thinking was the intent was well, two months we should be over the hump of this pandemic, but the reality is is that our health departments is, are still even two months later we still see a lot of businesses being closed and whatnot so. There, there is some very good argument to extend that and give our small businesses that extra time, if you will, to utilize those funds. And Howard, if I could add to what Susan said, I, I think, um, you know, when we had the first round of the PPP loan with about 350 billion in it, it, it went in 13 days, it was all used up. Uh, and then Congress replenished it um, uh, uh, with, with uh, about 310 uh, billion more. Um, and, uh, but there is still 130 billion uh, that has not been used. And, and my question is, why hasn't it been used? And I think the issue is just what Susan said, that small businesses now are concerned that uh, the, the loan won't be forgiven or the majority won't be forgiven because they won't have enough time in that eight week period to rehire their people and spend it on payroll. Uh, they are worried about being audited uh, by the treasury or the SBA and they don't want to be that. And so we've seen a number of uh, uh, people who have PP loans repaying them so that they won't be uh, in that situation. And then they have confusion about forgiveness and, and they don't want to be stuck with a, a payment that would be difficult for them to make even at 1%. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, I would encourage all small businesses to really let Congress know uh, that they need to make some adjustments. They need to lengthen the forgiveness period to 24 weeks. Uh, they, they need to change the ratio between payroll and non-payroll eligible expenses for forgiven for forgiveness to 60 to 40 percent instead of 75 to 25 um, and, and they need to give the option of having a longer term out uh, for those parts of the loan that it's not forgiven and I think if Congress makes that makes those changes we could see another spike in interest uh, uh, I'm getting a PP loan. Uh, there are still a number of small businesses in Utah that haven't received one that really could benefit from it and, and, and they should go after it. Thanks, Scott. 
Um, Susan, a couple of questions out of the question and answer section I wanted to throw at you real quickly. Uh, one one uh, business owner says, I, I own a semi-trailer business and I don't have employees. The main expense I have is the loan I took out to buy heavy industrial equipment, the trailers. Can my payments to the equipment to the equipment loan be considered part of the, uh, she says the 75% payroll expense, but that would be probably in the other 25%. Um, can, can the payments for that other loan be applied to forgiveness under any circumstances, Susan? This is, this is where I, I tend to like the 60, 40 rule where, because we do have, small businesses such as this trailer business where we're maybe not employee heavy, but we're equipment or goods heavy. So as the rules are currently written, he could deduct the interest portion of the loan. So, you know, we hear, we hear constantly, in fact, I've stated it, mortgage interest, but it's also interest on personal uh, personal property loans. So those trailers would be considered personal property. So that monthly interest payment amount would be deductible as part of that loan forgiveness. And then of course, utilities, rent, um, rent on, you know, if he's paying rent or mortgage interest on the building that's housing him. But this is where it would be nice to go from that 75% wages down to 60% to allow those small businesses that aren't as labor intensive, some ability to use these PPP loan funds. Susan, another question to that. Let's assume that the loan is forgiven. Is that gonna be uh, included as taxable? Is the forgiveness gonna be included as taxable income on next year's taxes? That's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. We don't know yet. Um, this is something that the CPAs have been working on to, I mean, we've seen the pendulum shifting back and forth on this. Yes, it will be included or no, it won't be included, but you also will not be able to deduct the expenses associated to that PPP loan. We do not have definitive guidance on that yet. So I, I don't even dare stick my neck out and say yes or no, because it's it's gone from one extreme to the other. I was in meetings yesterday on the American Institute and Treasury side and the IRS side trying, you know, seeing what kind of intel we can get on that. And we're just, we just don't have anything definitive. So we, we, we're staying on it. We need to stay tuned to that. Um, if we look at the intent, the intent was that, the, was that these funds would not be taxable to the lender, even though they're forgiven and that expenses would, you know, we would be able to continue to deduct expenses as we do. If we argue on that intent, then we hope the answer is no, it's not gonna be counted as income. But you know, devil's in the details on this. And Howard, I would add that the uh, dealing and fixing these tax issues is also being considered in the current legislation in Congress and hopefully they will deal with it and like Susan said, clear it up because the a clear intent was that it would not be taxable. Right. I think that's an important point, Scott, is that this is a very, is a, is a organic process. This is the first time we've been through it. And so as people raise these issues, as they become apparent, we are taking them up to Congress and trying to get them fixed. So be sure to voice any particular concerns that you have. Um, let us know and, 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 we have, I think there's some of these, like with the tax issue, we have several months to get that fixed. Um, with regard to the current forgiveness program, if you're at the end of the eight weeks, again, I will just restate something Scott said earlier. If you're at the end of the eight week period and you're not where you want to be, I just wait, uh, give, it a, give it a couple weeks and see if we can't get you a little more flexibility for forgiveness and maybe some flexibility as it relates to the documentation that you're going to need for forgiveness. We're working really hard on both of those fronts right now. I have confirmed with members of Congress that they don't expect this money back. When they appropriated this money, $600 billion for PPP, no one 
intended for that to get paid back. Their, their hope was that it went out, it was used for payroll, and it never came back. Um, it was forgiven. But we know that things don't always work as planned, and that's what we're working through right now. So if you're at the end of the forgiveness period as it stands right now, eight weeks, and you're not where you want to be, be patient, give it some time, and see if we can't make this work better for you. I think, Howard, um, um, we need to, you know, it, it, we need to work with the banker and the CPA as well on this because different banks may require, different credit unions may require different things, but if, the, if we're working as a team with the financial institution, the CPA and the small business, we will make sure that we leverage everything in our power under the current interim rules or whatever is passed to make sure that that loan is forgiven to our small business clients. And I would add to that, that I would encourage all small businesses to go on the treasury site or the SBA site and print out a copy of the forgiveness form because as they go through that, I think that will clarify a lot of the issues uh, that they need to know, the uh, material that they need to submit. And, and as Susan said, I, I think they should work closely with their CPA for advice and, and work closely with their banks and credit unions. And, and to that point, I was one of the reasons we're pushing hard for that smaller loan, de minimis, easy application is because you don't want to spend a lot of money working with a, a professional if you only got a six thousand dollar loan. We want all that money to go into your business and into the economy, um, and that's why we're working on that. Susan, is there a deadline though? How patient can they be? When do they have to file for that forgiveness or potentially lose access to forgiveness? I, th I think that that's going to be dependent upon their financial institution that they borrowed from. If they have some, um, if they have some deadlines or whatever, we know that the lender has 60 days to review that application form before they turn it over to the SBA. And the SBA, of course, has 90 days, as Scott indicated. Um, again, that's part of that banking, banking CPA relationship that we make sure that we're following those guidelines of the financial institution because we certainly, we certainly don't want to be late. But, but also to Scott's comments and even Senator Romney's, um, if we see passage of this House bill by the end of the month or even if the Senate passes it, and, and then, you know, makes a, does a corrections act to correct the 59%, um, then, then we've at least bought a little bit of time and we can, we can better leverage the use of those funds that we borrowed in the first place and receive forgiveness. Scott, what are you telling your borrowers in terms of um, how long that they have to, to, to submit their application for forgiveness? Well, currently, under the current guidelines, uh, they can apply for forgiveness without any type of financial uh, uh, hardship uh, through the end of this year. Uh, and then on January 1, interest and principal payments will be paid, uh, will be required to be paid. And, and so if you wait beyond December, uh, then uh, you will be paying interest and principal on amounts that may be forgiven. Uh, if the current bill that passed the House is passed by the Senate, uh, you will have uh, a, a 10 months uh, beyond the 24 uh, weeks uh, uh, before you have to apply and before interest and principal payments will be expected. And so that's, that's sort of the time frame. People have really until the end of the year uh, under the current guidelines and 10 months beyond that if the new guidelines pass before they uh, will have to start paying interest in principle on their loan. And, and when does the interest begin to accrue, Scott? It, it begins to accrue in January. There is a question on the Q&A about the very first, one of the things that Senator Romney raised there's a certification when you applied for this loan that the loan is necessary to to continue in business. 
Um, and initially, we told folks that, you know, if you were impacted by COVID, take the loan. And, and it was a real, it was a generous, it was, it was portrayed as a very generous program. And then some folks took the loan, and there were some questions about them taking the loan. I won't name any names, but you probably heard about it in the, in the news. And, and they started to back away and say, well, if you didn't really need the loan, you shouldn't have taken it. And that's really not what was being communicated early on. The Treasury has now come out and said, listen, if your loan is above $2 million, we're going to take a look at this certification of need. If your loan is below that two million threshold, we're going to assume that the loan was needed, um, and that's all we know right now. Uh, it, it seems pretty clear. Um, so, if your loan is less than two million dollars, I don't think you need to be up at night worried that you're going to have some kind of an audit where you're going to have to prove that you needed this loan. But if your if your loan is over two million, I think you know they have the right. They're going to exercise the right to look at that potentially. Um, but even then, you have to understand that the Treasury and the SBA, they're overwhelmed. Um, I I don't anticipate them being out with an army of auditors uh, scrutinizing these. No one in Congress, when they created this program, intended. For this money to come back. Their intention was to stimulate the economy, keep people employed during this period of time. Um, I hope that answers that question. Scott or Susan, do you have anything you want to add to that? You answered it well. Yeah. Yeah, I would go with that. Okay. I, I would say that I would, you know, intent is the, is the word of the day, if you will, on these loans was the intent to stimulate the economy. These loans, the intent was to help small business. Small business is the engine that runs this country. Um, and, and we hope that intent stays in the minds of our leaders of Congress, SBA, Treasury, as we move forward with this. You know, every small business, I would argue, has been affected by this pandemic. And, and it continues to be, and there were some questions about going forward, will there be a PPP2? Um, I think in general, the, the, it's been a very successful program. And, and I, I would sense that if, if we hit some uh, hurdles that we don't anticipate or that we can't anticipate in the coming months, you might see some variation on this. But for now, we're focused on PPP1 and entering the forgiveness period, making it as easy as possible, making sure that our goal is everybody achieves 100% forgiveness. And we're, we're trying to help you get there. I think Congress is trying to help you get there. If you're not there yet, uh, be patient. If you are there, Scott, are, is Zions or other banks ready to accept those applications for forgiveness today? Well, I, I think the, the real question is, I don't think the SBA or Treasury is ready to accept them yet. They're still working on, the, on that. So, um, uh, you know, if, if someone's ready to uh, apply for forgiveness, they should certainly uh, talk with their banker or credit union person and with their CPA, gather the information and, and submit it. Uh, the, as I said, the banks have 60 days to go through that. And, and, uh, and then they have to make a recommendation to the SBA. Um, and, and then uh, the SBA will, will take uh, uh, 90 days to decide when that happens. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, the SBA is, is pretty overwhelmed. They've done an amazing job, but the scale of this program is unlike anything they've ever administered in the period of time that they've been asked to administer it. And they've done, a, they've done an amazing job, but I just wanna give everybody a little bit of interesting perspective. All the money that is out in the economy, all these loans that were made, were made with bank funds. The $600 billion that we talk about really hasn't left Washington DC yet. Um, we're in the process, it may surprise you, 
we're still in the process of getting the information to the SBA as to the loans that we just made. And, and as soon as that happens, those loans kind of become official with the SBA guaranteed. Um, the banks will then earn a fee, but none of that's been paid yet. All of the money that's been in, injected into the economy has come right out of bank balance sheets. And fortunately, the banks and the credit unions came into this crisis in a very, very strong position. So we've been able to front all that. Um, it's just we're trying to do it in the way that they're telling us to do it and follow their rules. And these rules are are coming out all the time. We're getting new rules. So as Scott mentioned, we're still waiting for them to tell us exactly how to apply for these things. Um, but if you are ready where you want to be and you've had eligible payroll expenses, um, we're anxious to work with you to get you to forgiveness. But just know there's no urgency at this point. We've got just a few minutes left. I've tried to keep up with as many of the questions that have come through the Q&A. Um, Susan, I, let me just go to you. And then, Scott, if there's any last words, any clarification you were hoping to make today to this group before we end. My, my hope would be this this is this has been <laughs> this has been an organic process i mean we've we've had a few hurdles to jump over we have a few more hurdles to jump over um my hope would be that we work with our cpas our small businesses our lending institutions so that we can leverage these funds so that we can keep our small businesses in order i i too agree with howard and scott with comment made with a six thousand dollar ppp loan it seems kind of silly to spend funds on a cpa to make sure we're in compliance i will always say i'd rather spend your money helping you grow responsibly but um let, let's keep aware go to the sba website um there they they update it often but but we haven't seen anything for a week and a half that being said um we're certainly happy over the uacpa to field questions and to send you out to appropriate helpers as well Scott, any last words of advice? I, I would just uh, encourage uh, small businesses, if they haven't applied for a loan, to apply for a PPP loan while there's still money there. Uh, for those who are worried about forgiveness, I uh, recommend that they just uh, take a deep breath and, and that they uh, wait until we know exactly what the process is. I'd encourage them to, to go to the websites, the Treasury and SBA websites and read the guidance there, talk to their CPAs, gather the information so that they'll be ready when they need to apply, and then talk and lobby Congress to get these adjustments made. And if you have any input on how what you'd like to see changed, I'm sure that the Salt Lake Chamber would love to hear from you and their legislative committee. We're working closely with them and the Association of CPAs and all the business trades. The one thing about Utah, which is, I think, amazing, is just I, I, I think of teamwork. Uh, we've worked as a team, and if you've got some input, I would get it to the chamber. We're working closely with them, and we've got a great delegation in Washington, D.C., uh, and get that integrated into this new proposal. Um, with that, I think we've exhausted this discussion for now. We can have an update later, maybe once Congress passes the, any adjustments to this. Um, I think it'll be it'll be better than it is today. is my is my goal, and I'm very confident it will be. Even though it is workable today, I think we can make it better. With that, thanks all for joining, and thanks to the Salt Lake Chamber for pulling this together. Um, and good luck. Stay safe. <laughs>